Hello everyone, welcome back to Creative Culinary. So, I'm going to be doing something different. I'm going to be actually doing a movie review on the movie Get Out. Um, disclaimer, I will be telling the movie. There will be spoilers. So, if you want to wait till you see the movie before watching this here video, go ahead and click out now because I am basically going to be telling the movie, okay? From my perspective. Um, I'm quite sure that Someone else can watch this movie and can, and can get something completely different from it um, than what I can share with you all. But this is what I perceived and I wanted to share it with you all, my take on the movie and what I thought about the movie, as well as giving you a beginning to end rundown on basically what takes place within the movie. So if you see me looking down, it's because I am looking at my notes on my phone and I am testing out this webcam, by the way that um, came of course equipped with my laptop and I never tried it out so I just thought I would give it a shot and so here goes so before I get into the movie itself I want to first say that this movie was well made and well put together um, it is a horror slash, slash psychological thriller with also a little bit of sci-fi and humor and so you are more afraid mentally because there are a lot of what ifs, at least for me, when watching this movie, I, I experienced a lot of what if moments like, oh my gosh, what if that was me? So I was more afraid from just the mental aspect of the movie. Okay, so that's what I got from it. Um, so the movie was written and produced by Jordan Peele, who is known for um, his, comedia, his comedy sketch, Kay and Peele which I think came out, came out back in 2012, 2013. I've never watched it, but I've heard people say that it was hilarious. So based on other people's views, I am definitely going to try to check out that series and see how I like it because I do love a good kiki. <laughs> okay. And this movie, of course, debuted February 24th, which was this past Friday. And that's when me and my husband bought tickets to view it. And it was created on a $5 million budget. However, it over exceeded that budget and grossed thirty million just over this weekend alone. Okay, well, or either just that first day, that Friday de debut, he brought in thirty million dollars. So big ups to John Peel for this being his first big time movie. And I thought it was a uh, again, like I said, well made, well put together. Um, I love dark humor. I do like a good horror flick. Um, I'm a big fan of Stephen King movies. Oh man, his books and uh, just his creative, just his outlook on what horror is and how he defines um, horror. So I'm a big fan of his work, and I want to also go on to say that this is not the first time that this movie has been debuted. It made its first appearance um, about a month ago at the Sundance Film Festival. So, now it's in the States. So, you may have some bootleg versions out there because y'all know how that goes. When they, when they release these movies in other areas, sometimes people somehow get their hands on a copy <laughs> when they start to bootleg it. But, I'm glad we paid for it and we went and watched it and supported the movie because it is well written. Because it is written, produced, and directed by John Peel. So, big ups to him again. So, now that we got the kind of now that I've given you kind of a background of the movie and the creator and everything, now I'm going to go into some more of the openings of what I saw when the movie first came on. Okay, the movie from the credits starts off strange just from the beginning because basically what you see from the beginning is like this never-ending row of trees. While the beginning credits are showing, you know, like the title and, you know, giving credit to the producers and everything. You're like seeing with this never ending row of trees, which is, which appears that someone is driving down a road, but you never see who's driving. But you can tell that they're driving because if you ever looked out the window as a kid, you know how you look out the window, you just kind of see the clouds pass by. That's kind of the scene that they painted for you with the trees. And, um... There's also some weird music playing 
why these beginning credits are coming in, there's some a very creepy song being played. And I can guarantee you it's something you have never heard on the radio. I promise you, it's not that at all. It is a song that was strictly composed for this movie to help build the tone and kind of get you set up for what is about to take place. Okay, so that was kind of the first thing that struck me was the just how the movie came on along, which definitely reminded me of Stephen King because he is definitely famous for kind of giving you the anticipation and suspense of keeping you in suspense and not really knowing what's going to take place. But then again, you know something that is not good is going to come from it all. Something, something bad is about to happen. Okay, so that's that part. Then we go into, so basically, like again, like I was saying, you see the trees. So all we can assume is that this is the, this is an aerial view of the couple, which is Rose and Chris. That's the name of the couple. And they're on their way to her parents' house. So like I was saying, with the trees going by, you're basically, it's kind of prepping you up for the whole trip to their parents house because that's kind of the objective of the entire movie is what's going to take place once Rose gets her boyfriend to her parents house so that's how the that, again that's the opening now I'm also going to go on to say that there are a lot of visuals in this movie so some things I'm just it's just going to be hard to put in words you're just even with this hit me giving you spoilers I still would say go see the movie because there are just some things that I just can't put into words. You would just have to see it in order to get with the um, the vibe that I'm trying to you know share with you all. Okay, then the movie opens up to Rose getting out, getting breakfast for her and her boyfriend, and Stay Woke is playing in the back. And I think no, the name is not the song is not Stay Woke. The name of the song is Redbone, but the hook he constantly saying Stay Woke, Steady Creeping. So that song is playing while. The um, camera pans back and forth between Rose and Chris. Chris is back at his apartment, you know, conducting hygiene, shaving or whatever. And she's out getting food for them. So she finally does arrive at the apartment and they're, not, they're conversing, you know, or whatever. And, um, and you know, they greet each other and um, Chris starts to share his concerns to Rose as to, you know, because you know, she has convinced Chris that... Um, she has basically told Chris that she has never dated a black guy and she's yet alone never took a black guy to meet her parents. So, of course, this just makes Chris even more anxious and uncomfortable because he's like, OK, you've never dated a black guy, but yet you're you're adamant about me meeting your parents. So this whole time he's kind of uneasy about it. But of course, he goes along with it because he likes Rose. It's clear clear. That he likes Rose and that he cares about Rose. And by the way, they make a really cute couple, you guys. Um, I, I like how they hook them two up in this movie because they look really good together. So they're talking or whatever, but again, they continue. Um, they've been dating for four months, too, by the way. And, um, you know, Rose feels like, hey, it's time for you to meet my parents. And she reassures Chris that he has nothing to worry about, you know, that her parents are cool. And, um... That her dad, if he would have, he would have he would have voted for Obama a third term. I guess that's the I guess that's supposed to mean that Rose family, you know, are down with black people. I guess that's kind of the the stamp of approval or the confirmation to um, let Chris know you have nothing to worry about. My family is cool. Okay, so now they leave from that scene, and then the movie goes into where they show this black male walking. In a suburban neighborhood at night. Go figure. <laughs> there's another stereotype. Now there's a lot of stereotypes in this movie. Which are some. Yeah you could say stereotype. But they're actually. They do take place. Okay. So it's kind of a thin line between stereotype and reality. Because a lot of the things that they're showcasing in this movie. Really does take place. And really does affect black people in general. So it's not all. Just in my head. It, you know what I'm saying. Like some try to make it out to be like. There's some truth in a lot of the things that you will see in this movie if you decide to check it out. Because the, the message is much deeper than what I'm going to share with you. I promise you, it's worth going to see. Just for, from the political standpoint, okay? So, again, like I was saying, it, it goes to show 
the camera then goes into a scene where there's a black male walking in a suburban neighborhood alone at night. And while he is walking, walking, he realizes that he is lost and calls his friend for directions. So as he continues on walking, well, his friend, you know, he gives him directions. He says, okay, cool. He hangs up. So he continues on walking and he noticed that car driving by in a very slow, almost creepy manner. The car all of a sudden makes a U-turn and is now on the same side of the road as the black male. Because initially the car was on the opposite road of Chris. Chris was going north and the vehicle was going south. So this car made a U-turn and now it's going, not Chris, I'm sorry, <laughs> a black male. We don't, at this point, we don't know this guy's name. So uh, the car is going south. Chris is going, the, the black male is going north. But the car makes a U-turn. So now he's going in the same direction as this black guy. And um, so the guy kind of keeps fumbling with his phone all nervously because he's like, oh my gosh, I think this car is following me. So he starts to try to speed walk. But the car is still following him. So he said, not today. He just kind of busts out with that famous Kevin Hart quote. Not today. If you ever seen um, Laugh at My Pain by Kevin Hart, then you know what I'm talking about. And so, of course, everyone in the theater is laughing because we're all familiar with that stand-up comedy by Kevin Hart. And so he turns around and starts walking back in the opposite direction. So now, at this point, you, do, you no longer see the vehicle. And so... But we later find out that that's because the car has now stopped and the person who was driving has gotten out. So by the time they um, so when they so by that time, this person is right up on the black male that was walking. And so he ends up being attacked. He gets he ends up being choked unconsciously, dragged to the um, car, thrown in the trunk and the guy or the or guy or girl. We don't know who it is drives away because they're wearing a mask they're wearing like this night like the night armor helmet so you ne you never see this person's face and so they just drive on that's the end of that scene they drive away basically so now we it goes back to rose and chris which again is the interracial couple on their way to rose's parents house and in the most and in the moment of them driving chris chris pulls out a cigarette so Rose, um, we learned that Rose doesn't want Chris smoking. And we also learned that Chris <laughs> enjoys smoking, okay? It's a habit of his. He's a, he's a habitual smoker. So Rose takes the cigarette out of his hand, breaks it in two, and throws it out the window. And she basically expresses to him that, you know, she don't like that he smokes or whatever. And he just kind of let her have it. He don't really put up a big fight about it. He just let her have it, okay? Because, again, it just shows you how much he cares about Rose and he's all and he really wants to impress her and try to be the best boyfriend that he can for her in spite of him being a black male so um then of course they are still driving and all of a sudden a deer appears out of nowhere and Rose runs into the deer now it appears to me that the deer just came out of nowhere you guys because the scene happened the scene happened so fast with the deer that you never even see the deer's feet touch the ground. It was almost as if the deer was thrown out there in the road. And it also came off as if the deer was running from someone or something. Um, because even though there was... And then it also kind of set up the tone that wherever Rose's parents live is obviously in a woody area. It's, they live... Obviously, they live in a secluded wooded area because... That's how they are able to come in contact with deers. So, of course, again, like I was saying, Rose hit the deer. She stops her vehicle. Her and Chris gets out and they inspect the vehicle. And they notice that the um, passenger mirror is broken. There's blood spread on the vehicle or whatever. So, while Rose is on the phone with the police, you know, so that she can file an incident report. Somehow, mysteriously, that deer, even though he was hit at a pretty hard impact, made his way across the street. Now, you don't see the deer actually galloping across the street but Chris decides to walk over where the deer is and he goes over and watches the deer as the deer you know is dying and you notice that it's almost like a hole on the deer and I was just like wow he hit that car pretty hard so I don't know if it came from that accident or if the deer was already injured again that's something I guess John Peel would only know <laughs> but like I said it happened so fast that you didn't even have time to kind of 
I didn't have time to really even take in the whole thing, but I found it kind of weird that Chris went over to look at the deer. I was like, well, oh, okay, I guess he have a really soft spot for animals. That's what I was thinking. But later on in the movie, you will learn why he went over to that deer because that, that, is, an, that is an important scene. It doesn't seem like it right away, but you later on discover why Chris stopped and went over and checked on that deer. Okay, so after that, Chris walks back to the vehicle and he starts and, um, you know, stands over where Rose is and they wait for the police. The police finally arrive and um, Rose starts explaining to the police what took place. And as she's talking to the police about the accident, he asks for Chris's ID. And so Rose intervenes and she's like, wait a minute, he wasn't driving, you know. So basically, why are you asking for his ID? And she was basically saying, well, is it because he's black? You know, so there was another, you know, clear thing that was taking place in the movie. And, um, and of course, the police never answered her because he like, hey, I'm the police. And I can ask for whomever, whomever ID I want to ask for, whether they were driving or not. That's basically what his answer was to Rose. But she stood her ground and she was just like, no, you don't need his ID because he wasn't driving. So eventually the cop gave up on trying to get Chris's ID because I think he eventually caught on to what Rose was trying to say. And I guess he was like, you know what? I'm not going to even go there with you. So he just let them off with a warning and just tell her to make sure that she get her gets her vehicle fixed. And they continue on their journey to her parents' house. So, they have found, so now they finally have arrived at Rose's parents' house. They are, they are approaching the house, which is a very large estate, almost like a plantation style slash ranch type of home. A lot of land. Again, it's out in the wilderness. But, um, you know, it's a manicured lawn, lawn um, extended driveway, the whole bit, the black shutters, the rocking chairs, you name it. That's kind of what their home is set up like. And then uh, while they're driving up to the um, front door, Chris notices the groundkeeper, which, by the way, his name is Walter. And he's a black male. And he's one of the guys who works for Rose's parents. So, you know, and Chris is just looking like, hmm, okay. They got black people working for them. Okay. <laughs> but, you know, of course, they continue driving on. And then Rose's parents come out, which are named Dean and Missy. Dean is the dad. Missy is the mom. And they come out and greet them. And the family go inside. And then, and then Dean, which is... Um, Miss uh, Rose's father greets Chris like, "Hey, my man," trying to you know show, um, uh, trying to basically portray that he's cool with black people and he's hip to the whole black lingo, if you will. And so he's like, "Hey, my man," and he reaches in, you know, for the hug and the, you know the dap, you know, dap him up. Okay, and then you know, of course, Chris got this look on his face, like you know, just still kind of weird because he's surprised that her family is this nice to him because he wasn't expecting her family to be this cool, but they were. And, you know, so he's very, he comes off like a very liberal, they come off like a very liberal family, like, you know, whatever way the wind blows, we'll follow. The mom, she seems very chill, almost hippie-like, very calm, very relaxed. Um, the dad is a neurologist or brain surgeon, and the mom's profession, she's actually a therapist um, slash psychiatrist who also practices hypnosis. So that's her profession as well, which she also, which she actually does inside of their home. Okay. So we touched on that. And Rose then shares with her that she, that she hit a deer. And Dean responds by saying that he hates deers and that them basically killing that deer was a good thing because deers, they pretty much destroy the ecosystem and the vegetation and all of that. So that also kind of shows you the father's mindset and how he has this kind of weird mindset and weird outlook on life to kind of say that he basically hates deers, but remind you, he has a deer taxidermy in his house too. So I guess he also hunts deers too. So that's what kind of made me think about maybe that deer was running from him. <laughs> he probably was trying to hunt that deer or something, but anywho, so they do that. They talk about 
She tells him about the accident. He expresses his hate for Dears. And then Dean begins giving Chris a tour of the home. And he shares with him that he and his wife love to travel and they like to bring back different little trinkets and things, you know, from their different trips across the world. And so he also, Dean also shows, um, Dean also shows Chris Missy's room where she does her therapy and her hypnosis. And he's just like, oh, okay. And um, somehow they get on the subject of Chris and cigarettes. And um, Dean said he used to have that same bad habit. You should let my wife hypnotize you. She does this great hypnosis method that will just, if you just think about a cigarette, you will get a bad taste in your mouth. And Chris is just like, eh, I'm good. <laughs> he's like, no, I'm not into the whole hypnosis thing. But back to the um, back to the um, tour. So Dean then comes across a picture of his dad, and he shares that with Chris that his dad lost to the Olympian Jesse Owens. But he says that was a good thing because keep in mind, you start to realize Dean kind of has a thing for black people <laughs> for whatever reason. But again, you know, it will unfold. You will see why they. That this family kind of has an obsession with black people, especially black men. Then they arrive to, ki to the kitchen and that is where Chris is introdu introduced to their maid, Georgina. Um, which is a black female. And she gives out this very... Um, she gives out this very um, uneasy, weird type of vibe. Because she has like this blank stare. Almost like she's looking at you, but it's like she don't know that she's looking at you. And so she's basically just standing in the kitchen I at the kitchen island all poised with her hands folded across each other. You know, like, hello, how do you do? You know, whatever, like, okay, whatever. Then it leaves from that. Then the family goes outside and Chris shares with the family that they they go outside and all of them start to sit down at like this little metal, um, you know, like outdoor patio set. So they're all sitting down and um, conversating and they somehow, I think the mother asks Chris how did his mother die. And uh, Chris basically tells her that she died from a hit, or run, hit and run when he was 11 years old. And so he's basically been, ever since he was 11, been holding, around, holding this remorse and guilt that if he would have called the police, that he could have somehow saved his mother. But instead, he just stayed at home sitting watching TV. But in reality, we know that there is no way he could have saved his mom. But, you know, sometimes as kids or sometimes even as adults, we um we tend to blame ourselves for certain things. You know, we start to ask ourselves, okay, what could I have done differently that could have prevented this from happening? So he has carried on this guilt, this great burden ever since he was a child up until his adulthood of, thinking that he could have done more to save his mom during that hit and run. But in reality, he couldn't. And that explains why he went back to the deer when the deer was dying, when they hit the deer. That is why he went back to check on the deer because he has always held on to that guilt of, is there something I can do? How can I make this situation better? But in reality, there's really nothing he can do because sometimes, you know, when it's your time to go, it's your time to go. So basically, that's what that was. Then the family goes and outside and Chris shares with the family that his mother died. Okay, I said that part. So, again, okay, so Georgina, while everyone is sitting at the patio set, Georgina starts to go around and pour everyone a tall glass of sweet tea. How ironic. Yeah, all black folks love sweet tea, don't we? So, <laughs> she's going around pouring everyone a glass of sweet tea. And by the time she gets around to Chris, she goes off into this daze. And while she's in this daze, She's just pouring the tea and it accidentally spills over. So, of course, everyone sees this. And uh, Missy suggests that she tells Georgina, why don't you go and lie down? Lie down. You need to get some rest. So she basically tried to make it seem like Georgina has been working all day and she's extremely tired. So that's why she made the mistake of wasting the tea. So, you know, that's another kind of telltale sign that something's not right with Georgina. And then Rose's brother make an appearance. And by this time it's nightfall. And so they're all at the, they're now in the inside of the house having dinner. And 
So at dinner, Rose's brother, which is named Jeremy, he comes off as a drunk, okay? I think he, he comes to the house with liquor already in hand. So he's already been drinking, you know, all boozed up. And so he comes in the house and he starts sharing um, embarrassing stories about his sister, basically saying that when she was younger, she used to bite her toenails and save them. <laughs> like anybody wanted to hear that before dinner. But for some reason, he felt like that was a story he needed to share. So then he began asking Chris questions about, you know, him, about, about him, trying to get to know him better. And the daddy tries to intervene and say, no, 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 leave him alone. He said, hey, you had your turn. You had your chance to get to know him. So why can't I get my chance to get to know him? And they started talking about jujitsu and, um, you know, just talking male stuff. And um, Jeremy was basically telling you know, jujitsu is all a mental thing. It's not all about the physical strength. It's more about mental strength. And then he goes on to even try to ask Chris to show me a move. He tried to get Chris to stand up and show him a move. But Chris was like, no, nah, I'm not going to. I'm not going to do all of that. You know, this is my first time meeting you. And you talking about, let me show you some moves. So um, the mom kind of interrupted. And she said, well, hey, let's have dessert. So she goes into the kitchen and she has one of those swinging doors. You know, so she has one of those kitchens that where you have that door that divides the dining room from the kitchen. Kind of like my home, but it's not a swinging door. But I do have a door. And um, she swings over and open the door. And in the process of her swinging open that door, you get a quick glimpse of um, Georgina, the maid. And Georgina is already standing there holding the cake. You know, and we're like, how did she know Missy was about to go in that kitchen and, and get dessert? Because, like, she's just standing there holding the cake, which was very weird because she had this very bizarre look on her face when they flashed that, you know, that quick peek at her. She had this weird look. And so Missy returns to the table with a carrot cake. She comes out, hey, it's carrot cake. And she cuts everyone a piece and they're sitting down enjoying the cake. So, you know, dinner is over, dessert's over. So later that night, everyone has went off to their rooms. And um, after everyone has went off to bed, at least we think everyone is asleep. Um, Chris gets up to have a cigarette because he is now feeling a bit uneasy due to the weird vibes he'd been getting from the family and the black people that they have hired, at least that we, that's what we think, you know, that they have hired to work for them. So Chris is feeling uneasy. He's like, something ain't right here. I hadn't figured it out yet, but I know something ain't right. So while Chris is outside smoking, all of a sudden we see the groundsman running full speed towards Chris. The groundsman again, his name is Walter. And um, he's like running like Forrest Gump. And if you've seen the trailer, you know what scene I'm talking about. So he's running like Forrest Gump straight in the direction of Chris. Now, you mind you, Chris never moves, never flinches. He's still just smoking his cigarette like he don't know what's going on. And right when he gets up to Chris, he pivots. He makes a sharp left and just runs off into the night and you no longer see him. That was the most eerie and weird scene you could have ever imagined because it's, it's pitch black outside and the only light is their porch light, okay? So just imagine being outside and someone running full speed towards you. And so that's basically what was taking place. So that, that scene had everybody kind of on their seats when it took place, okay? So let me see. So Chris decides to go back inside and while he's so as he's going back inside of the house, he passes Missy, which she's sitting in her little therapy room. And so she asks Chris to she asks Chris, do he want some tea? And he say, no, thanks. And then um, she asks him to come join her, you know, come sit in there with her. And he declined. And she said, please. So I guess be, with Chris being the nice guy that he is, he gave in and he went in there and sat with her. So she's sitting there having her tea and um, Missy start going in on Chris about his smoking habit. Basically, I guess to try to make him feel as worse as she could about it. And because she know Chris really likes her son, she even uses um, Rose to make him feel even more guilty. Like, you're still smoking? Not around my daughter. That's my daughter. Don't do that. So making, you know, really just making Chris feel bad about this habit that he has. So 
after she go on that rant about him smoking, she picks up her teacup and she goes to stir in her teacup, stir in her teacup. And um, she starts asking Chris about his mother again. And so Chris, that's when he goes into great detail and he kind of, um, mind you, he's sitting across her in a chair. So he kind of goes into detail as to, you know, I was sitting on my bed watching TV, you know, when basically my mom got hit and she was saying, describe what you see. So now we realize, okay, when she was stirring that teacup, that was her way of hypnotizing him. So she wasn't doing the old trick with the clock, you know, how they put the clock across your eyes and say um you're getting very sleepy <laughs> in the modern day they, they, they no longer use that technique she has come up with a different technique where she can just stir her teacup and just the sound of her spoon hitting that um china you basically become hypnotized and so again like because he's hypnotized he's he's crying profusely because he's talking about his mother and he's talking about the pain that he felt back when he was 11 years old and so now she say, go into a sunken place. I think that the, those are her exact words. And then it plays like this. Um, I don't know if you're big on watching horror movies. That sound is say, like, like the end of the world has just took place. I don't know how to describe it. But it made that kind of eerie music during that scene. And then all of a sudden it just showed the younger Chris. When he was sitting on his bed watching TV, he kind of his body just slumped through the um, mattress. And then it showed him in like this abyss of darkness and stars. And uh, it was like he was just falling, like a never-ending fall, which is called the sunken place. And so as he's going through this never-ending fall, he's been he's able to look up and see Missy, like almost through a TV-like type of screen. It's kind of weird because if you've ever seen um, Insidious and how they go into that warp of dead people and how it's just nothing but darkness how they can go in and out through that um warp or uh, whatever time warp or whatever you want to call it that's kind of what this scene reminded me of how he can go into that space when he's hypnosed um hypnotized which is called the sunken place but again he can see everything that's going on but he can't interact so it's almost like he's just a shell or a vessel and so that's basically what's taking place while she has him under hypnosis. And then all of a sudden, Chris wakes up. It just shows him in a bed. He's no longer in the chair. It, it goes to a scene where he's in the bed and he just jumps up as if he had a bad nightmare. So he gets up and... um. So again, like while he's hypnosed, he can't move. While he's hypnotized, he cannot move. He's like in a like a paralyzed state. Mm -hmm. So it okay, he wakes up and then it shows the next day. Now, if I'm leaving some parts out, and if you've seen this movie, please fill me in. I'm just kind of trying to go off of memory here. Because I've only seen the movie once. I know most times people don't do reviews until they maybe seen the movie more than once. But um uh, I don't have the funds like that to just keep going in a the movie theater looking at it. I re <laughs> so it's going to be a minute before it even come out on DVD. So again, keep in mind, this is a review just for me watching this movie one time. Okay, so it's the next day. Chris goes outside to take some photos and spots Walter. He goes over to Walter chopping wood and tries to have a conversation with him. Walter begins to talk about Rose and how she is mighty fine. And he has this Walter. Now, remind you, even though they're black, Walter and Georgina, they have accents like old white people. I'm just that's the best way I can explain it. Okay, they don't. They're not the, the way they speak is not what you would expect them to sound like. They sound like they're trapped in time back somewhere in the 1940s or something. And so he was basically, you know. Almost like he was drooling over Rose, you know, Walter. He was talking about Rose and how she's the pick of the litter, basically. And that, you know, he basically got the cream of the crop date, with, you know, because he's dating Rose. And uh, so Chris is, is taking this as if, well, you must have been with 
Rose or something. If you're thinking this much about her, you're thinking this highly of Rose, you you had to have some type of relationship with her. So, um, Chris ends up just walking on off. So, there's also a scene where Chris puts his phone on the charger to let her discover that someone keeps taking it off the charger. So, he lets Rose know that he think it's Georgina. Not knowing jo Georgina is listening to their conversation. She's eavesdropping on their conversation. And so Rose asks Chris, Chris if she should let her dad know. And of course, Chris tells her no because he don't want any problems. You know, especially with this being the first time he meet, he's meeting her parents. He don't want to bring any drama, okay? Chris also asks Rose if she and Walter ever had a relationship and she denies that also. So now it's kind of like Rose is kind of playing that reverse psychology type of thing and making Chris, it then it now makes Chris appear uh, paranoid. Like, because these are the only two black people at the house besides himself, that they must want Rose in some way or they're trying to sabotage him in some type of way. So Chris also asks Rose, okay, he asked about the relationship, she denies it. So back at Georgina, when Rose leaves the room, she enters and tells Chris that when she was cleaning, she accidentally calls his phone to come off the charger. And this is Georgina. This is what she tells Chris. And um, she's talking again in that little accent. And she just does that. No, 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 no. Um, Missy and Dean are good people. They're good to us. You know, because I think he asks her a question about, you know, the people that she's working for, you know, what does she think? And she's like, no, they're good people or whatever. But she does it in a very weird, eerie way. And you would definitely have to see it in order to get the full concept of what I'm talking about. Because it's definitely something that you must see. Like I said, some of the stuff is just visual. And some things are going to be hard for me to explain because you would just have to see it for yourself. So after that. Um, Chris finally gets a moment to talk to his friend Rod, which is the whole reason why he's been trying to get his phone, phone charged up. But obviously they don't want Chris to be able to contact any outsiders because they don't want him to, you know, they don't want anyone to know what's going on. But of course he's able to contact his friend Rod, who works in TSA, about the encounters he has had since he's been at Rose's parents' house. And that he believes he, and then he also goes on to share with Rod that he believes he was hypnotized because he um, he no longer has the desire to smoke, which was what Dean had shared with Chris, that if he would have allowed his wife, Missy, to hypnotize him, he would no longer have a desire to, for cigarette. And that's exactly what took place. He no longer wants to smoke. So now every part, and I also want to go on to say now that every part um, that Rod plays in this movie is hilarious. Um, Rod brings on that comedic factor in the movie to kind of break up the um, intensity of the movie and all of the what else and the dark eerie moments of the movie. Um, John Peel did an excellent job in introducing comedy, but not to the point where it came off cheesy. You know what I'm saying? Because I know some horror movies try to do that whole comic type of thing, but then it comes off cheesy. But it did not come off cheesy at all in this movie. But Rod was against Chris going to see her family in the beginning. So he was against it. But of course, because Chris cares about Rose and really likes Rose, he wants to oppress her. So anything she says, he's all for it. And um, Rod basically believes that Missy is hypnotizing black people and making them sex slaves. <laughs> so that's Rod's theory. So apart from all that, guests start to arrive in limos. And of course, Rose is trying to play crazy like, oh, What's going on? Who are these people? And um, Rose's parents going to say, well, you know, um, we have this event every year. I guess they do it annually. I don't know. So she was like, yeah, you know, her mother was basically telling her this is the weekend that we're going to be hosting this event. So she was basically like, oh, I didn't know that. OK, but whatever. People start, arri start arriving. And all of the guests are elderly white people, all of them. And they are all admiring Chris. So they're all here for this big event that Chris has no idea exists. But they know why they're there. But Chris doesn't know what's about to take place until it's too late. So even one elderly man asks Chris if he knew how to play golf. 
Because again, you know, most white people think that black people are all, we're all good at, we're good at every sport, no matter what it is, whether it's golf, uh, swimming, whatever sport we is out there, we somehow are great at it. And, um, and the man even went on to say, I know Tiger Woods, you know, as if that, you know, I guess had some great meaning. And then Chris runs into another older woman that starts rubbing on Chris's muscles and she asks him, is it true? And then she makes this like eye movement as if she's looking down at his private parts. Because you know what they say about black men, they're willing out. And once you go black, you never go back. So she, she was basically testing that stereotype. And of course, this is all being said now in front of Rose. And Rose don't open her mouth not one time. So that was kind of weird right there. Um, and the old lady has a husband of her own. He's actually standing right beside Well, He's not standing. Because he's actually in a wheelchair, but he's right beside her in a wheelchair. Um, and all my think he had an oxygen tank. So that was another clue. So Chris also notices another black person at the party, and he is at the table having a drink. So Chris, feeling relieved that he finally see another black person besides the, the, um, the servants <laughs> and himself. So he sees another black guy. He goes over to approach him, you know, and goes into introduce, introduce himself. So um, Chris offers his fist. You know, he wanted to do the fist pump. But instead of doing the fist pump, the guy grabbed his hand and kind of just palmed it like this. Instead of doing the fist pump, he did like this, you know, just kind of gave it like a firm shake. And so Chris was like, OK, that was strange. So, um, Logan's wife then walks over, because that's the guy's name. We learned that the guy's name is Logan. So, Logan's wife then walks over, and she has this look on her face, like this uneasy look, like, why are you talking to him? You know what I'm saying? Like this, she just had this very uneasy look on her face, like she was about to be exposed or something. So, she can't, she comes over, and she whispers Logan away. And she and she basically was telling Logan, you, you don't need to be drinking. She was telling Logan that he shouldn't have been having a drink. But she was only sipping on a little glass of wine anyway. And again, mind you, Logan has that same accent that the maid and the groundman, groundsman talk like that 1940s um, old world type of accent. So then Chris pulls Rose into the house to share with her some of his concerns. And they are going up the stairs. And while they're running up the stairs, it's like everything around them stops. And it's like all of the... Um, Couples there just start looking at them run up the stairs like they was, I don't know, in shock. That was kind of a, that was a very weird scene. And, um, but of course, Rose and Chris don't notice that everyone's just staring at them, you know, because he's just trying to get her up to her room so that he can talk to her. So Rose, um, so he basically expresses to Rose, um, what he think about Walter and all of that, you know, that he think Walter may like Rose. And she's like, no, that's not true. You know, she basically brushes it off and all of that. And so they end up, um, so Rose end up taking Chris back outside and all of the guests are looking at Chris and asking him, what is it like to be African-American? And Chris just laughs it off, you know, kind of like, <laughs> you know, like in this uneasy manner, like, really? Is that, did y'all just ask me that? And so... Um, Logan is in the, becomes the forefront of the crowd and, um, he decides to take a picture of Logan because in his mind, he's like, you know what? This guy look kind of familiar. So he kind of, he tries to creep up his phone to kind of, you know, how you try to sneak and take a picture or something and not realizing that he still had his flash on. And because he still had that flash on, it triggered Logan to go back in this trend. And so Trent Logan started to attack um, Chris, and he kept he just kept yelling him get out get out. And then blood his nose actually started to bleed. So I think someone grabbed him. I don't know if it was Missy or Dean, but someone grabbed him and um, walked him on back into the house while Chris is standing out there looking like what just happened. So um, Missy was able to whisk um, Logan off into her her therapy room and put him back on the hypnosis. And um, she basically told everyone that um, Logan had a seizure. So that's why he was behaving that way. 
And so Chris was just like, yeah, right. I know seizures when I see him. I have a cousin who has seizures and that wasn't a seizure. He was spazzing out. And so the dad said, well, on a lighter note, why don't everyone go play bingo? So while everyone, while everyone went outside to play bingo, um, by this time, Logan has already sent the picture to Rod, his friend in TSA, so that Rod can kind of do his own investigative work to see if, you know, who this guy really was. And then they later find out that the guy is from Brooklyn, Brooklyn, just like they are, and that he had been missing for over six months. And, um, Eventually, he shares this information with Chris, which makes him even more worried and uncomfortable because he's like, OK, this man has been missing for six months. Why is he here with this older white woman? And she's kind of, you know, cascading him around like he's some trophy. OK, so this again, like I said, makes Chris even more uncomfortable. So Chris and Rose go for a walk. And while they're on their walk, Chris expresses to her his concerns and how uncomfortable he is. So Chris. um. So Rose, of course, she reassures him and, you know, said, hey, listen, we can leave if you want to leave. We'll come up with some excuse. Don't worry. We can leave the night if you want. And so, of course, um, Chris give her, gives her a hug and they make out and all of that. And he tells her that he loves her. And she, she says she loves him, too. And so before I go any further with them, let me go back. Let me tell you about the bingo scene, because it does flash back before. Um. They go into great detail with Rose and Chris. It flashes back to the bingo scene. So while they're playing bingo, um, what they call bingo really isn't bingo. It's a silent auction. So everyone is just sitting down and um, Dean is kind of the leader of this whole silent auction. And they have like this big old picture of Chris underneath the gazebo as if you're basically like you're at his funeral. The way they had the ceremony set up was almost like a funeral service. And so everyone is kind of throwing up their bingo cards and whoever was the highest bidder basically get to purchase Chris for their own personal use. And um, and the highest bidder ended up to be the blind art dealer who um, they're both fans of each other, which his name is Jim, by the way, the art dealer. Jim is a fan of Chris's work and Chris is a fan of his work. And so they kind of have a conversation, Chris and Jim, and Jim was just basically, you know, even though he's blind, um, Jim was basically telling Chris that he has someone who describes artwork in great detail. And that's how he chooses the pieces that he wants in his um, art exhibit or whatever. So that's so that's that scene. Hold on one moment. I gotta get my charger. So Chris and. Um, Rose returned from their walk and they begin to pack. And this is when everything begins to unfold. As they are packing, Chris notices that Chris notices that the closet door in Rose's room is open. And um, so when Rose steps out to go and um, I don't know, grab some things from another room, Chris takes this moment to check out what's inside that closet. So he goes in there and he sees this red box. Well, let me first say this. This is not the first time that they show a glimpse of this closet either. I think one time when um, Chris gets up, I think before he gets up to go smoke a cigarette, they show a glimpse of that closet as well. But anywho, so Chris goes into the closet. He discovers a box that is filled with photos. He starts going through the photos. And as he's going through the photos, he notices that there's nothing but pictures of him of Rose and black men of different black men that she has, so I guess, dated over the years or whatever the case may be before he met him. So basically, the lie that she told that he was the only black guy that she's ever dated, he realizes that wasn't true because he's going through these pictures. And again, he sees Rose posed up with different men. One of the guys he actually recognized, recognizes, which is the groundsman. And then he also comes across a picture of Georgina, Georgina, which they, which is the maid. She's also posing, smiling with, um, Rose. So I don't know if, it, if her, and, you know, at one point Rose pretended to be a lesbian to kind of lure her in, or if she tried to pretend, pretend like they were BFFs or whatever the case may be. But somehow she was able to get Georgina in that house so that they can, 
use her for whatever they needed to. So he never says nothing to um, Rose, of course, about these pictures. You know, he just continues to pack. He basically tells, asks Rose, do she has the keys? And she said, yes, I'll get them in a minute. That was another red flag because we're like, okay, what do you mean? You know, I'm thinking to myself, what do you mean in a minute? You know, either you have the keys or you don't. <laughs> so I knew right then that was a red flag because it seemed right then that she was kind of going to be stalling to find the keys. So, um, so in my mind, I, I, I put two and two together and realized, okay, you know what? Rose is a recruiter. So her job is basically, basically is to go out and lure black men and I guess even women into her parents' home so they can sell these black potentials off to wealthy white people to be able to use for whatever their purpose may be, which I will let you guys know in a quick minute. You probably have already figured it out. But that's basically what the business is that um, Missy and Dean have taken on. They've basically taken on a business that Dean's father founded. And so they decided to continue on his legacy or his movement, which they do mention on early in the movie that when... um. Rose was trying to play like she didn't remember that the event was that party was going to take place that weekend. And she's like, yes, we have this every year. You know, this is what your grandfather wanted. You know, so it, it told you right then that, OK, this is something that they kind of do out of a tradition. OK, then there is even OK, I said that part. So as they are walking down the stairs, was they they're now they're walking down the stairs, you know, because they said they were gonna leave that night, so it's nightfall. So they're walking down the stairs. The brother is standing in front of the front door swinging a lacrosse stick. So you're like, okay, you know, me being the analyst that I am, I'm already putting two 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 and two together, thinking to myself, okay, at some point there's gonna be a struggle. <laughs> so but, you know, how he was swinging that lacrosse stick, you knew he wasn't going to let anyone get past that door. Okay, and um, after that, we see the mom, I think she's sitting off in some corner. And the dad, they they show you the dad, you know, walking around the fireplace. So all of them are kind of standing on ready, trying to see what Chris's next move is going to be. So they can be on guard to make sure that he doesn't leave out that house. So the whole time, so now Chris has realized, okay, something's up with his family. And so he keeps asking Rose, where are the keys? Get the keys, get the keys. And she's like, I'm looking, I'm looking. And then he says, Rose, the keys. And so finally she pulls her hand out of her bag. And the whole time she has her keys just kind of dangling around her finger. So the whole time she was just pretending like she couldn't find the keys just to buy time. And so once he realized that she still had the keys, she going to make the comment, babe, you know, I can't give you these right. Holding up the keys. So that's when Chris realized he was in some real trouble at that point. So, of course, by that time, Chris still tries to make a run for the door. It wasn't happening. It was, you know, one against how many of them? Had the daughter, the son, the mother. One against four. So it's kind of like. Chris, you really thought you was going to get out that door. There was no way you were going to get out that door. And you got four people that's ready to attack you. So, of course, they attack Chris, knocks him unconscious, and then they're able to drag him into um, Missy's therapy room. So once um, Chris wakes up out of his slumber, because she did have to hypnotize him in order to get him in that room. So once, she, once he came out of that hypnosis and he realized where he was, now they had him. His arms strapped down to the chair this time around so that he couldn't move. And then a film starts playing. So, um. So while this film is playing, they show you, um. They show you the man, Jim, the, the art dealer who actually bought Chris. They show you him on the film. Like it's like a flow model, model TV that sits across from um, Chris. Mind you, Chris is strapped down in the chair. He can't move. So he's kind of basically forced to watch this film. And so he's watching the film and then the man pops up, Jim. 
and he's basically explaining to Chris the procedure that's about to take place. Now, while they're showing Jim, Jim is already prepped for surgery. I mean, he has on his, his um, hospital gown. He has his IV bag. They make sure that you see that in the clip and everything. So you know that some type of surgical procedure is about to take place. And so Jim is explaining to him basically what takes place. He's already kind of went through. He basically tells Chris that you went through the first and second stage. Now you're about to approach the final stage, which is where they will take Chris's brain and implant it inside of Jim's brain. And he was saying that they will leave some some part of your brain still attached to you so that we so that Chris is still so that Jim is still able to um operate um so that Jim is somehow still able to operate um Chris's body almost like he's in a robotic state so he he'll be able to still operate Chris's body because they left that little slither now he says sometimes you may come and go you know because they, they left that part of you in there, which explains why when um, Chris took the picture of Logan, how he went into this trance. Because they still leave some little slither of who you originally were in your, in that body. And I guess that's left behind so that when they need to hypnotize you, you're still able to be hypnotized. And of course, Chris, is, he, he gets it because he's actually answering. He's actually talking along with Jim. So he's. At this point, he's well aware of what's about to take place. And, and you can just see the disappointment and the hurt and the pain in Chris's face when he realizes what's about to take place. So um, Chris was like, uh-uh. I ain't finna go to out like this. <laughs> so um, after they get through showing Jim, they show the grandfather. You finally get a chance to see what the grandfather and the grandmother looked like before they transformed over, which you will later realize who the grandfather and the grandmother were and I and y'all probably can already put who they, who they are who body they took on and um they basically show back when um they show um Jeremy and Rose's mom and they show them when they were little kids so the dad has been doing this for decades this whole transforming procedure where he's been capturing black people and selling them off to elderly white people who want to kind of get the black experience I guess so this has been going on for decades and again Missy and Dean has taken over the job because um the Dean is a neurologist again he's a brain surgeon so he's equipped for it and then Missy is equipped for the job because she's a therapist and she knows how to do hypnosis so they make the perfect team Dad, the, the, the grandfather just kind of came up with the blueprint. Now, keep in mind, Chris's friend, Rod, while he's back at home in Brooklyn, he's doing his research. And he comes across a lot of other black males that has went missing. So he is afraid for his friend because he's like, something ain't right. I need to save my friend because there were times where Rod was actually trying to call Chris and he was unable to contact Chris. And then one instant, someone did pick up Chris's phone, but it wasn't Chris. This was when um, when they had put Chris under hypnosis so they could strap him down into the therapy room. In the process of that, Rod called and um, Rose answered the phone. And she was trying to, uh, she was saying something, whatever it was. I can't remember the conversation her and Rod had. You would just have to see it to, to, to know what the conversation was. But whatever it was, it was to distract Rod. But Rod, being, Rod was too smart to fall for that. He fell for it, but at the same time, he he knew it was a trap. He fell in the trap, and then he read a little, re, later realized, okay, she just trapped me. So, so Chris wakes up in Mrs. Therapy Room in a chair facing the, okay, I already said all of that. And the name of the, and we then we finally learned the name of the procedure, which is called the coagula. The dad somehow put together some little film, almost like a health film, something that you watch in maple health class. And he basically talks about this newfound experience and his new life, almost kind of like his objective was to take a black person and a white person and kind of merge the two to get, I guess to kind of make the best of both worlds in his mind. That's basically what his objective was. 
was. And the procedure is called the coagula. And um, so once that film goes off, we notice Chris funneling with some of the cotton from the chair because he has a nervous, because he has really bad nerves, because he hasn't been able to smoke. So clearly the hypnosis hasn't worked because he's still been urging to smoke a cigarette. We later realized that was just a lie. That's just what she told him. It's probably a temporary fix. And so he later realizes that, you know, because he has nerve problems, he has scratched that chair. And so some of the cotton is coming out. And we later realized that what Chris did was remove some of that cotton and put it in his ear. Because at the end of the film, what it shows is a teacup with um, Missy stirring it which is how she puts them under hypnosis and how she puts them back in that trance so that they can be um, transferred to be, you know, and be used for whatever their, their purpose may be, which was in this case was he was going to get ready to be prepped for the whole surgery transplant thing. But this time around, Chris didn't get hypnotized because he had the cotton in his ear. And we were like, yes, thank you. <laughs> he survived because everybody was like yelling at the TV, or yelling at the screen in the theater like, please don't let him go back on the hypnosis. And so that's when we see that he pulled the cotton out of his ears and we're like, okay, whew, thank you. So then we are shown the operating room for the very first time. We are seeing where these this surgery procedure takes place. And in the process of them showing the room, we see Dean cutting into Jim's skull, the art dealer, the person who bought Chris. And um, it's very detailed. If you ever seen any of the Hannibal movies, you know how when Hannibal Lecter has the guy at his dinner table, now he has his brain cut open, and he goes in and he starts serving and eating the brain. That's basically what this scene looks like. Because they basically have Jim's head cut. They show where um, Dean starts cutting around Jim's head, lifts that part of his head off, throws it in a metal waste basket, takes the brain out, throws it in a metal waste basket. So that he can put Chris's brain inside. So, um, so then they show a scene where the son, Jeremy, is strolling down the hallway on his way to get Chris. Because he's thinking Chris is still under hypnosis. He's thinking Chris is, is under hypnosis at this point. Because he don't know that Chris did not trick them and had the cotton in his ear. So he's strolling down the hallway with a um, wheelchair already hooked up with a little IV bag, thinking that he's going to get Jeremy, I mean, thinking he's going to get Chris and get him prepped for surgery. But that wasn't the case. Chris clocked him in the head with some type of orb, and it knocked um, it knocked Jeremy unconscious. enough. It gave him enough time to escape. It gave Chris enough time to escape, and he found out where Dean was, you know, and where the operating room, room was, and he ended up killing Dean. With the um, deer taxidermy. He used those um, antlers on the deer. And he basically shoved them into um, Dean and he died. And for some reason, um, Dean had candles lit <laughs> in the operating room. And so one of the candles lit and everything just caught on fire. So we were like, yes, Chris, Chris defeated the father. So now he makes his way to find Missy, the mother. And so he finally approaches her. Of course, she's always in that therapy room. So he locates her and they both iron the teacup. It's like sitting in the middle of this little coffee table. She eyes the teacup, he eyes it. And of course, Chris goes to die for it, knocks it down so that she's not able to put him under hypnosis. She somehow picks up, I guess, an envelope opener or something sharp. And she was able to stab, stab him through his hand. But of course, because he was so angry and so... um focus on killing her it didn't even phase him so i think he took that same tool and killed her with it so she was dead so now he was on his way to locate rose rose is up in her bedroom honey with her headphones on eating dry eating dry fruit loops and sipping on milk typing in her computer potential um ballers or, or potential nba players how funny was that and um no, actually, you know what? I take that back. He actually didn't go up looking for Rose. They just showed a scene of what Rose was doing. And that's what she was doing. She was listening to music. 
She was on her computer searching up more potential prospects as because that's exactly what she typed in NCAA potential prospects in her computer. And some um, basketball players popped up. And so in the process of her doing that, Chris was escaping, was trying to escape. And then that's when we later discovered that the brother wasn't dead, that Jeremy wasn't dead. He was just knocked unconscious. So he was somehow able to try to, he was trying to, again, stop Chris from leaving. And, of course, Chris had to finish him off. He eventually killed him, and then he escaped and um, jumped in Jeremy's vehicle, and he was start driving. So in the midst of him driving off, that's when Rose hears something, and then that's when she jumps up, grabs a shotgun, and starts, you know, running out the door trying to catch up with Chris. She fires one time. She misses that first time. So um, in the process of Chris escaping, he runs into Georgina. He hits. He hit accidentally hits Georgina. She's dead, or at least we think she is. So he was about to leave her there, but he looked in his rear view mirror, and he saw her, and he went back, got her, and put her in the vehicle. Because again, he started thinking about back when he was a little kid, and when his mom died, he felt like there was more that he could do. So in any situation where he feel like someone is about to die, he feel like he has to play the hero, because it puts him in the mindset of his mom. But we later discovered that Georgina wasn't dead because she starts to try, she she wakes up out of her slumber and tries to attack Chris, which causes him to run into a tree. And then she bursts out, my eye, you messed up my eye. And that's when we realize that she's the grandma. That's the body that um, the grandma took on. She took took on Georgina's body, which which explained to us why she was always um the way she talked, which explained her accent and her little swift little walk. Um, Georgina had this real swift walk about her. So I guess that's how the grandma used to walk. And then when um, Chris hits that tree, that is when she dies. And then somehow her wig is shifted. And we see this long scar across her head. And um, that's how that's when we know, okay, she had that surgery procedure. So that the grandma can take on her body. And so. Um, I think Rose she fires again. Or did she? No she didn't fire again. So I think when the car. When, when, when Chris hit the tree he got out. Somehow Walter made an appearance. And so did Rose. She was she was much closer to Chris now. And, and then Walter he was somehow. In the picture. So she said get him grandpa. And threw the gun to. Walter and you know so so that he can basically kill um Chris but somehow in the process I, I don't know if it was I don't know if Chris pulled back out his phone again and took a picture or he did something and it made something made some type of sound and it triggered Walter into that trend and instead of him shooting Chris he shot Rose so you know Rose is down and then in the process of and so after Walter shot her, he then shoots himself. And so um, right in the midst of all of that, uh, Chris realizes that Rose isn't dead. So he goes and try to choke her out. And in the process of him choking her, she's like she has like this weird grin, grin on her face as if she's getting off of this whole choking segment. Like it's turning her on or something. And so he realizes this and he stops. And so in the moment that he stops and he starts to get up to walk away, a police car comes up. What appears to be a police car pulls up to the driveway. So Chris immediately throws his hands up. Hands up, don't shoot. <laughs> like, hey, um, whatever you need to do, just don't shoot me. Okay, so he throws his hands up. And I'm immediately thinking, okay, Chris, you're going to go to jail because you're surrounded by dead bodies. Ain't nobody left here on this estate that's alive but you. You are surely about to go to jail. But then they, the camera zooms in and it shows you that it says airport. It doesn't say police. It says airport. And we're like, okay, this is Chris's friend, um, Rod. He came to save the day. So Chris gets in the car. And him and um, Rod proceed to drive off. And so as they're driving, Chris asks Rod, how did you find me? He said, I'm mother effing TSA. We make ish happen. And honey, that was so funny because mind you, Rod was funny throughout the whole movie. He gave the humor that that movie needed. And again, it wasn't in a cheesy manner. 
So, and that was kind of the closing ending on that movie. So, I hope you guys enjoyed this um, review. And this is and this is a beginning to end review. Like I said, now I may have left some parts out because this was my first time. I only watched it once, so I'm only going off what I what I can remember. So if you've watched it and if you feel like I've left anything out, please feel free to leave it in the comment section. Um, again, this is a great political movie. There's a lot of a lot of pure political standpoints in the movie, and um, you can also feel free to do your own research. And kind of get more of a backstory on what this movie means and represents if it somehow went over your head and it just wasn't clear enough for you to see what, what was taking place. Do some research. I encourage any and everyone to go out and see this movie no matter what your race is. Sorry you guys, I'm eating a piece of candy. I definitely think it's worth the view. So that is it you guys and thanks for watching and I will see you all in the next video.